Daniel chapter 1. We've been talking over the last few weeks uh, in the series, Power Shift, where we're talking about shifting the spiritual atmospheres and climates of the world that, that, we, uh, that we live in, starting with our homes, starting with our jobs, you know, the local places where we have influence. Amen? The Bible teaches us that we have been given the dominion and authority, all right, in the earth, all right? You know, for so long, we taught in, in, in our churches that we were simply aliens trying to survive in this world. But we were not of this world, and we were just trying to survive here until God came back and took us up. But that is so contrary to what the kingdom teaches, all right? Well, what God, Jesus taught about the kingdom. He came to teach us that we are the greatest power and the greatest authority in the earth. Amen? All right? He said that whenever you open up your mouth and you put his word in your mouth, that there is no higher level of authority in all of the earth, all right? So that means that we have the ability and the power with the things that we say and the things that we do to shift power in this world that we live in in favor of God's kingdom, amen? And so, so we talk, we've been talking about this over the last few weeks, and this morning I want to talk to us about the Babylonian captivity of the church, all right? Because whenever I look in the scripture here in Daniel that we will see, that we will see in Daniel, um, I find there are, very, uh, there, there are a lot of similarities between what took place in the life of uh, uh, Israel, basically the southern kingdom of Judah, what took place in Judah in the fact that they went into captivity into Babylon, and what I see in the church world today. Because what we will find here is that we have got a, we've got a tremendous task ahead of us to change the image of our churches, the image of our message. Amen? I mean, understand that, that words are, are, are meaningless if, if you don't have action to back up those words. Amen? And for so long, the church has been, we've been spewing out words, but we have no action. And because we have no action, nobody believes in the, in the information that we're giving them. So you've got to have the right information with the right image in order to be effective. All right? And so we're going to look at this this morning. Daniel chapter 1. Let's begin reading in verse 1. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Now, let me, let me set this up for us, because what's taking place is the southern kingdom of Judah, all right? Judah meant praise, all right? Uh, so the people of praise have been taken into captivity into Babylon. If you were to go back and you were to study the history of, of, of Israel, you would find that, that at this time, Israel was broken up into two kingdoms. You had the northern kingdom, and then you had the southern kingdom, which was Judah, where, where, where Jerusalem was. The northern kingdom, about 150 years before, had come under Assyrian captivity. Well, the Assyrian uh, 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 military and the Assyrian empire eventually fell to the Babylonian empire. And at this time, whenever King Nebuchadnezzar had come into power in the Babylonian empire, they came into Jerusalem and they captured all of the people and took captivity all of Jerusalem, including the articles of the house of God, uh, of the temple. All right? they, they, they brought the, the people into to, to Babylon and held them captive there. Now, what you've got to understand is there's a distinction in, in the captivity that they had compared to what they had experienced many years before in Egypt. They were not in bondage into slavery. They were allowed to live in their own homes. They were allowed to have somewhat of their own culture when, at, at, at various times. But yet, but yet at the same time, they were not allowed to go back to their own homeland. It had been seized. And as such, it had been raided, and all of the goods of it had been taken into Babylon. All right? Now, we will go down and we'll begin to read in verse 15 and verse 17. 15 through 17. And at the end of ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Now, what this is talking about here is Daniel and three other men, of which I'm not going to try to pronounce all of their names, but what we know of them as is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, okay? Whenever, whenever the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, besieged on Jerusalem, what he did is he took the men of the king's palace 
and of their household. Men that were well-schooled, men that were, were good-looking, men that were, were skilled in various er areas, men that were full of wisdom and, and were educated. And he took them and he said, I want to bring them into my own palace and we're going to teach them the Chaldean language. All right, And they're going to begin to learn how to operate because I want to use their skills in our empire. Okay, And this was common practice at that time. Well, at the time, what he told him, he said, there's two things that I want them to do. The, my, my translation and this translation says delicacies. He said, I want you to give them some of my delicacies and I want you to give them my wine. That word actually translates as meat. All right. So what he was saying is, I want you to give them my meats and I want you to give them my wine. All right. And I want you to feed them on it for three years and, and teach them and train them in, in, in our culture. So that after three years, we can begin to use them to, to influence our society with their leadership and with their skills that they have. Now, we know that Daniel stands up. And if you go back and you read the preceding verses, and I didn't want to bog us all down in there. But if you go back and you read the preceding verses, Daniel goes to the, the, the captain of the eunuchs and he tells him, he says, I don't want to partake of the meat or the wine that he's offering. I would rather just have vegetables and water. And the reason why, if I believe that if you go back and you study the scripture, you will find that meat is always synonymous with doctrine. The apostle Paul said it this way. He said, he said, I have not been able to feed you the meat of the word. You're still on the milk. Okay. And at some point we've got to mature from the place of just being on the milk to being on the meat. So it denoted doctrine. It denoted information and, and, and knowledge. Okay. Wine always in the scripture referred to things spiritually, okay? The Bible talks about how he cannot put old, uh, new wine into old wine skins and how he would bring forth new wine, all right? Talking about the Spirit of God. So, so meat always equal doctrine and, and wine always equal things of the Spirit. So in other words, what Daniel was saying is, I don't want his doctrine, I don't want his way of thinking, and I don't want him to put his Spirit on me. Because I remain on the meat of God's Word and I remain dependent on the Spirit of God. He said, give me vegetables and give me water. And so the scripture teaches that, that tells us that he, he, in this process, that the captain of the unit said, wait a minute, we can't do that because as soon as he sees that, that you've been eating vegetables and water and your countenance is not going to be what theirs is, he's going to know that something, something's up. So, so Daniel puts a test out there for him. He said, let's try it for 10 days and see what happens. So they did it for 10 days. And the scripture teaches us that after 10 days... His image or his countenance was better than that of the other men and women, young men and women. All right? So, so he, he says, I will not yield to this culture. See, the problem we're having in the church world today is so much that we have yielded ourselves to the culture of this world. Rather than standing up and saying, I will not partake of that meat, and I will not partake of that wine, I will not partake of that doctrine, and I will not allow that spirit to be upon me, what we've allowed to happen in the church world is we've become indoctrinated with the way that the world thinks. Let me understand, the Bible teaches us that the kingdom does not operate according to the world standards. Jesus, whenever he was before Pilate and he was being tested, he, he said this. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were so, my servants would have come and they would have fought for me. He said, but my kingdom is not of this world. So therefore, I don't operate according to the principles of this world. I don't think the world, way the world thinks. I come with a different principle, a different thought process process a different pattern remember how we were talking about how after spiritual climates are sustained for a long period of time it develops strongholds in the mindsets of people you begin to think according to the environment that you were raised up in all right and those strongholds what happens many times is it comes into the church naturally because when we come in we get saved we bring all of this way of thinking into the church right all right stay with me we're gonna go somewhere here the greatest challenge of every leader in the church and the greatest challenge of every church body is to break down the strongholds in the minds of people. The strongholds, the ways of thinking, the arguments that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. Because it is those strongholds in the, that way of thinking that keeps the kingdom of God from moving forward. All right? Because the kingdom don't operate according to the principles of this world. 
And so we see this story here, and I believe it's so pertinent, and we're going to look at some more scripture and some more examples here in a moment, where whenever, whenever they came in and they besieged Jerusalem and they took the people, they said, we want to enculturate them with our ideals and our way of thinking. I mean, understand, that's the way the enemy works. He will trap us at times and experiences whenever we are young and begin to develop mindsets in us contrary to what the Word of God teaches based off of the experiences that we once had. Amen? That, that's why whenever you, you're raised up in a hostile home or whenever you see abuse and you've been abused yourself, you begin to think different. And it's nothing more than the enemy trying to trap you in, in, in immature thinking because he knows that one day you're going to get saved and whenever you get saved, it's, it, you, you might be saved, but you ain't going to be able to make any impact in the world because you don't think any different than the way you thought before you were saved. See, we often think that, you know, if, I, if I'm saved, that that's going to change everything. You can be saved and still be really messed up. Amen? You can be saved and still not think the right way. You can be on your way to heaven and have no impact on the way. Saved, but still thinking the way you used to think. And see, the enemy knows this, and he understands this. But I believe that, that, that God has, has equipped us with the tools that can change this. Amen? All right? Now, let, let's look a little bit further. Let's go down into verse 19. It says, Then the king interviewed them, and among them all none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore they served before the king... And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. The world has raided the church for its talent, for its skills, for its ideas, How many of you believe that the, that the church and the kingdom of God is supposed to be responsible for having the most creative ideas, the most talented people, the most skilled musicians than what the world does? Then why is it that we fight so hard in the church world whenever it comes to developing this talent and to put that talent on a stage and say, go and shine. Because we develop this mindset that says, if people are, are too gifted, they'll begin to think higher of themselves than what they should. So we got to make sure we keep people nice and humble. Come on now. Somebody begin, got to begin to elevate them and begin to use their talents. And, and, and next thing you know, church people start tearing them down. This is what Nebuchadnezzar noticed. He said that these guys are ten times more skilled and ten times smarter than all of my own magicians and all of my own astrologers. Why? Because they had been raised on the doctrine and the meat of God's word and God's law and God's way. And they had been raised understanding what the Spirit of God was all about and how it operated. We're mighty quiet in here this morning. 